Hello, um, here we are in chapter 24, the chapter on speciation, essentially the process in which, there we go, new species form. And so this is in contrast to the previous chapter on microevolution in which we were talking about a single population or species just changing from one generation to the next, um, the allele frequency is changing. In macroevolution, we're talking about a longer-term process in which we get uh, s new species forming. And there are different ways this can happen. You can have one species that over time becomes a different species. This is known as anagenesis. And then you can have a situation where one species changes into two or more different species over time. And this is known as cladogenesis. You're essentially forming different clades or groups. Um, clade is the term a systematist would use to describe this process. All right, so how do we define a species? The primary way is what's known as the biological species concept, in which we define members of a species as those individuals who have the ability or the potential to interbreed with each other. So, looking at these two birds, for example, we see they look quite similar, but they're actually different species because they do not interact with each other much or interbreed with each other at all. Whereas, of course, when we look at people, we see people are quite different, um, but of course they can all potentially interbreed with each other. <clears throat> okay, so now, what's going to keep two species from reproducing with each other? We refer to these as isolating mechanisms, and they come in two forms, the prezygotic and postzygotic. In the prezygotic, a viable zygote and embryo never forms. In postzygotic, you can get the formation of an embryo, but that embryo often is of reduced um, uh, vigor, you might say. Let's talk about each of these now. So, of course, habitat isolation. If two species are not even getting in proximity to each other, then there's not going to be the potential for mating between them. If they are active at different times of the day, or if their mating seasons don't coincide, as is the case with these skunks, then those two are not going to breed with each other. You can also have particular behavioral behaviors, if you will, that sort of reinforce that two species mate. And if one, if a potential mate is not exhibiting a certain behavior, then you don't consider them a mate. For example, in the, here we got some music. Galapagos Island, the blue-footed boobies have this interesting look with their blue feet, and they do this particular ritual when they are looking for a mate, and the males know what they're looking for, and the females know what they're looking for, and it's, here they are, here's a, I believe the male is right here on the left, and the female's on the right, and they show their feet to each other, and they make particular noises. And here he is giving her something, giving her a little uh, piece of uh, stick or something. And they just know what to look for each other in a mate. And that reinforces that this person is a potential mate, this bird, I should say. All right, you can go to the slide, Sean Moodle, to see the rest of that fascinating video. All right, sometimes the parts don't match up. Um, and that could be in an animal or in a plant. For example, in these two different species of plants, the flower parts are arranged such that when pollinators go in and out, the pollen is not deposited on the right place of the other plant. So therefore, they don't fertilize each other. Here's some sea urchins. Sea urchins have external fertilization. They release their gametes into the water. And with this situation, the gametes from one species, even though they might be intermingling with the gametes of the other, they just don't recognize each other. The sperm cells from one species do not fertilize the egg cells from another species. So those are all the prezygotic. They keep fertilization from happening. Now, postzygotic. Here you get the formation of a zygote and an embryo and even perhaps an individual, but 
Often those hybrid individuals will have reduced viability. They don't survive very well. Other times they're sterile in the case of a mule, which is the cross of a donkey and a horse. Mules are sterile, so that's a dead end. Other times hybrids form. They might be fertile, but they have lower fertility and they tend not to persist for very long. So they just tend to break down. So, whoops. so again, all those um, are post-zygotic barriers. All right, now the biological species concept has its limits because you can only define a species based on the ability to mate. And of course, uh, sexually that is. And of course, there are some asexual organisms like bacteria. And so it's hard to use that concept for them. Extinct species that we only have fossil evidence. We obviously can't tell whether things were mating with each other. And obviously, if there's something you don't really know much about the reproduction of them, it's hard to use the biological species concept. So in these cases, we use these different ones. And these first two, we can kind of clump together because they're primarily used for <coughs> uh, extinct species, ones we only have fossils for. We basically look at the shape and size of things, and if two different skeletons of a dinosaur are significantly different enough, we would assume that they were probably different species. With, say, bacteria, we can look at where they live, what they do. Um, <clears throat> a species like E. coli that lives in the guts of mammals, we would consider a different species than something that lives in a hot spring. Um, probably because they're not going to get together, and also because, again, they just have such different ways of doing things that they're separate species. Phylogenetics is a little, I don't know, weird, if you will. It, um, it just looks at the genes that you have. And if your genetic constitution is different enough, then we could consider you separate species. All right, how does speciation occur? Well, here's sort of two main ways, allopatric and sympatric. Here we have an um, ancestral um, population. And it gets, in the allopatric situation, it gets broken into two separate populations. So at first, they would be the same species. But if they're isolated from each other long enough, then they can become two separate species. They would no longer recognize each other as potential mates. Now, the one that's a bit trickier is what's called sympatric spe speciation, where you never really get isolation, but yet they s form two different species. We'll talk about how that can happen. So allopatric, again, is where you get geographic isolation. It's not too hard to imagine how two different populations can develop into separate species if they're isolated long enough, like these ground squirrels that are basically isolated from each other by the Grand Canyon. So they're not going to get together to mate, and so they develop into, over time, two separate species. <clears throat> now, um, here's a, an interesting experiment with fruit flies in which they take an initial population and split it into two subpopulations. In a control, which they don't show here, those two subpopulations feed on the same type of food. But then in the experimental group, they're fed different types of food. And so they do this for several generations. And then they let the flies get back together. Well, what happens? Well, when the populations were divided but set, fed the same foods, even though they were from different subpopulations after you put them together, they generally recognized each other and would mate with each other. As you can see, these numbers are not that much different. But when we take the ones that were fed different food, we can see that males and females that fed on starch tended to just mate with each other, and males and females who just fed on maltose tended to mate with each other, and not as much in between. There was some, but not as much. You could imagine that perhaps if they let the experiment go even longer and longer, that those numbers would come down even more. And so this is isolation or reproductive isolation based on a food source. And it's thought that that's perhaps a way that um, you get sympatric speciation occurring. Here's another way sympatric speciation can occur through polyploidy, particularly with plants. Polyploids are individuals that have extra sets of chromosomes. And with autopolyploidy, what happens is um, an individual here, they have a diploid number of six, and they may reproduce parts of them, branches in a plant, for example, that has 
um, twice the amount because of problems during cell division that occur. And then those parts would, reprodu would produce these gametes that essentially are what we would call unreduced gametes. They're gametes that have twice as many chromosomes as that individual normally has. If two of those gametes were to get together, then you have created this polyploid individual. And this polyploid individual would be basically unable to cross with the diploid individual because of um, problems during meiosis. And the gametes, when they get together, they don't really match up. <coughs> Now, allopolyploidy is when two different species hybridize and form a polyploid. And here's a scenario in which that can happen, these two separate species. Um, this one produces one of those unreduced gametes. They cross and create a hybrid. Now, notice the hybrid has seven chromosomes. This hybrid is going to be infertile, again, because when it produces gametes, they're not going to match up because of the odd number of chromosomes this individual has. But, and the reason it's thought that this is more common in plants, is because this hybrid could then just reproduce asexually through time, but then ultimately it might do a back cross with one of the original species and sort of reconstitute an even number of chromosomes, but now it's twice as many. And so now you have this species that has basically um, been created by the hybridization of two different species and has extra chromosomes. St. Patrick can also thought to be created through sexual selection. These two separate, of sick, separate species of cichlid fishes, these are the males. Under normal conditions, the females of this type only recognize these males and mate with them, and the females of this type only mate with those males. But when the experimenters changed the light such that the colors of the males were really no longer, you couldn't differentiate from them so much, the females just mated with either type. There was no mate selection, if you will. And so essentially it's sexual selection, which we talked about in the previous chapter, driving these unusual characteristics, colors in males, that reinforces the difference between these two species. Hybrid zones, where you have two different species coming together, you can often get the formation of hybrids. Here's two species of, of uh, frogs that live in Europe. Here we are. Um, this is Italy. Germany and Russia over here. And so you got these two separate species, but where they come together, you will have hybrid zones. And over here you see this is this shows basically the proportion of uh, genes for a particular type. And so this is mostly of the one type over here and mostly of the other type. But you can see in between you get some hybrids that basically are to varying degrees mixtures of the two different types. Now, these hybrid zones, sometimes the hybrids, again, are not very fertile. And so the reproductive barriers between those two species are strengthened. Other times, the hybrids can be perfectly fine, but you tend to just find them in the hybrid zone. They don't really spread too much beyond that. Um, <clears throat> other times, again, those hybrids can be of, of moderate fertility, but again, it does not cause the two species to merge. All right, last thing. The rate at which speciation occurs. Come back to that slide. So here on the left, the gradual is a model. This is how Darwin envisioned it, that you would have species that would slowly change through time, one turning into two. But the work of Eldridge and Gould, these two paleontologists, when they looked at the fossil record, they developed what they called the punctuated equilibrium model. And that is they saw that you would get rapid change over a short period of time, and then these long periods of not much change, of stasis. And so it really wasn't so much gradual, but there would be rapid change, and then a period of long period of no change. And so, in reality, you probably get both, depending on the particular group you look at and how quickly the environment is changing. Where you have a rapidly changing environment, then you can get this there's these rapid changes and where the environment's perhaps not changing so much, you might get this more gradualism model. Uh, model. Essentially, both probably happen depending on the, the species and groups. So again, macroevolution are these changes that occur slowly, or sometimes not so slowly over time, causing the formation of all the species that we see in the world today. Okay, thanks.